Welcome back, everyone, to the closing plenary of Worthling's 17th annual U-Town meeting. My name is Cristian Andre Iñiguez Figueroa, and I am a junior from Imana High School in Tijuana, Baja California. <laughs> this is... This is my second year attending a U-Town meeting, and for me, it has been an honor being a conference moderator for the first time. Addressing this year's topic, Global Conflicts, Human Impact, Human Solutions, has been an amazing experience for me. Having the opportunity to not only participate, but help lead a program like this, has been a transformative and inspiring experience. And I believe that all of us here, no matter what role we have played today, have contributed to the goal we set out to accomplish this morning. We have opened our minds to specific global topics that affect us all. We have changed ideas and action plans with incredible speakers we have volunteered the time today to share insight on potential ways we, as youth, can make a difference and do our part in decreasing conflicts with human-based solutions. So, at this time, please join me in giving our speakers a sincere thank you for their huge contribution today. <laughs> now, as you enter this theater, you will receive an evaluation form. In your, uh, wait, yeah. in, your, in your tote bag, you have a pen that you may use. However, if you need a writing utensil, please raise your hand quietly and a volunteer will come by with a pencil. Towards the end of the closing, you may complete your evaluation, but please do so quietly out of respect for everyone else. By completing this form, you will have the opportunity to vote for next year's conference theme. Let your voice be heard by choosing next year's topic and make next year's meeting an even deeper and greater experience. At this time, I would like to remind everyone to please turn your phones to silent mode to avoid any distractions. Lastly, I would like to finish by giving another sincere thank you to the person that makes this program possible, and it's just right there, uh, our program officer, Debbie Martinez. <laughs> and, and Ms. D. Aker here, the founder. <laughs> and a big thank you also to all of you for sharing your topics, I mean, sharing your questions, your opinions, and overall knowledge on such important global topics. Please give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> and now, it is my great pleasure to welcome our closing plenary moderator to the podium. Please welcome Chi Chi Chang from the Bishop School. Hello. My name is Chi Chi Chang, and I will be your moderator for, the, for our closing plenary. As a senior at the Bishop School, this is my fourth year attending the Youth Town meeting. This year's conference has been a particularly inspirational one for me as I was served as a WorldLink intern this past summer, and it's my great pleasure to have seen this conference take form. It is also my great honor to stand here before you and introduce our next three speakers. So now, without any further ado, let's get the closing presentation started. Our first speaker this afternoon is Christi, Christy Edwards. Christy Edwards currently serves as director of the International Humanitarian Law Team at the American Red Cross. While working with DC organizations, including Vital Voices, Global Partnership, Wo Women Thrive Worldwide, and the Institute for Women's Policy Research, she focused on international human rights, international development policy, and gender issues. Ms. Edwards also developed a private practice of asylum representation for political refugees, and has published articles on sex trafficking in China and legal advocacy strategies for women's rights in Morocco. Please join me in welcoming Christy Edwards. Thank you guys so much. Um, not all of you guys know this, but this is coming home for me. I'm actually from San Diego and have spent many, many, many an evening um, at the IPJ listening to some fantastic speakers. So it's, it's just truly a pleasure for me to be back here with all of you. And thank you so much, Dee and Debbie, for, for inviting me back to San Diego. And I'm certainly not missing the negative degree temperature uh, on the East Coast at the moment. <laughs> 
Um, for those of you who I didn't blindfold and make, go th make you go through a simulation today, I just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview about the role that the Red Cross plays in international conflict or internal armed conflict. Many people don't actually know that the ICRC, or the International Committee for the Red Cross, was actually established by treaty. It was um, instituted by the Geneva Conventions when they were written. And the ICRC is uh, it's a neutral uh, party, and it was created to enforce the Geneva Conventions. Since there's no big police force out there that, that goes around and, and strong arms countries into abiding by the rules of war, the ICRC acts as a neutral organization that goes in and negotiates with governments to make sure that they're abiding by the principles that they have signed on to. And currently, every single country in the world has signed on to the Geneva Conventions. It's the only uh, treaty body out there that everyone has agreed to abide by. The ICRC also uh, conducts confidential visits to detainees and makes reports to the government. So when um, prisoners of war or detainees are taken um, prisoner, they, they go in and monitor the uh, prison living conditions, whether or not they're treated humanely, and uh, when, when they find issues at stake, they go and have conversations with the government that they do not publish. And this gives um, the, the ICRC a really invaluable role because they are allowed access to places that many other organizations never have access to. And this is what kind of distinguishes a humanitarian organization from a human rights organization. And both of those roles are very, very important. Most people think of maybe Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, and of course the very, very important role that they play in documenting abuses and of course all of the other horrible things that go on in the world and they bring light to those situations. And that plays a very important role um, hopefully in, in creating, you know, so the, the name and shame um, aspect of getting countries to abide by the, the treaties that they have um, signed on to. But humanitarian organizations have a very particular role in that they do not ever publish uh, their information and they remain neutral so that they do get access to places that human rights organizations may not have the ability to, to um, people that they want to talk to or places where they might not be able to see. Finally, the ICRC um, is the major um, delivery mechanism or coordinator for humanitarian assistance. Medical aid, uh, food communications, and they go into conflict zones that many other uh, organizations either don't have access to or the governments will not allow other organizations to have access to. But of course, not um, knocking any of the other uh, wonderful human humanitarian organizations that are out there. We work very closely with many organizations delivering humanitarian aid and many other multilateral organizations such as the UN and World Bank, IMF, um, who are working to develop uh, countries in areas where, where they might need more financial assistance. I want to leave you guys with um, one basic thought, and that we talk a lot about global conflict, and, and many people think of conflict as happening somewhere else, either internationally or internally, but it's happening in a country where it doesn't affect us day to day. But I want to see a show of hands. How many of you um, have, I know there's representatives from both the U.S. and Mexico here, but how many of you are first generation uh, immigrants in your community or second, immig second uh, generation immigrants? Show of hands. That's quite a big number. You know, in the, in the United States, one in four uh, out of every person living here is a first or second generation immigrant. How many of you guys, and, and you don't have to answer this question, but think about it, how many of you guys come from countries or know of people in your schools or in your communities that come from countries where there is a conflict going on? Pretty big number, right? So those people all have family, friends, contacts that they have lived, left behind, and it really does affect um, people when they know that their family and their loved ones are somewhere where there is a conflict going on. They might not be safe. They might not be able to talk to them regularly. And quick note again about the Red Cross. Most people also don't know that we have an amazing program called Restoring Family Links. So if you have not been able to talk to someone um, who's in a different country, you might not know where they are. Uh, they might be in a refugee camp or in an area affected by conflict where telephone or um, online communication is down definitely check out the Red Cross. Call your local chapter. They have people there that can help you try to get in touch with your family members or your loved ones. Um, 
Also, members of the military, even here in the United States. Many people um, have friends or family that go into the military and uh, go into conflict, conflict zones. So we, of course, want to make sure that our service members are safe and that the other countries uh, in, in global conflict abide by the rules of war so that if anyone is ever taken captive or held as a prisoner of war or detainee, that they are treated humanely because it's very, very important for both sides uh, to abide by the rules. You guys, you know, as young people, have such an incredible opportunity to be sitting here today and learning about all of these amazing organizations and issues that most people your age are not typically exposed to. And we really count on you guys as the future leaders in your communities, as political leaders, as leaders in business, nonprofits. Um, we really count on you guys to know all of the issues that are going on in the world today and to make smart decisions about how we engage with people around the world. You know, with globalization, it's, the world is so much smaller than it ha ever has been before. Um, with Twitter alone, you can talk to a million people at the you know, drop of 140 characters. So it's really important that you guys um, know what's going on and take an active role and um, are engaged in your communities. So I will lastly just leave you with um, the goal. I would, I would love for you guys to educate others. You've learned some pretty incredible things today, probably some very hard things, and probably some very thought-provoking things. And I know you guys have all gotten you know, the, the hashtags and um, links on, your, on the back of your programs. Um, so please take advantage of those. Um, please share, share what you've learned on Facebook. Um, tweet about some of the things that you thought were interesting. Go online, find other organizations here in San Diego or in Mexico that are dealing with the issues that you think are interesting and that you might want to be passionate about and get involved. Um, it's a great thing not only to put on your resume as you know, you're looking towards college applications, but for yourself personally. It's very important that, um, that, that, you, take, that, you, that you give back uh, to your communities when you've learned something pretty incredible. Um, if you're interested in opportunities with the Red Cross, I would highly encourage you to contact your local chapter here in San Diego. Um, and my colleague Mariana has also promised that if you guys are interested in, um, in connecting with the Red Cross chapters in Mexico, she'll, she'll do a little digging and, and find um, who our, our counterparts are down in Mexico. Um, we've got many Red Cross clubs at many of the school, high schools, colleges, and universities here in the, in the area. We do a lot of really fun events. Um, some of you that went through the simulation in, in my workshop today, we do quite a few of those kinds of activities throughout the year. We would love for you guys to get involved. Um, and so you can check out our website, redcross.org backslash rules of war. And we've got a bunch of information about our peer education programs on there. And we would love to um, share more information with you there. And again, just want to say thank you so much. And if you guys have any questions, I've got business cards up here and would love to chat with you further. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Next, we have Lauren Kent Delaney, the Director of Educational Programs for the Carter Center, a not-for-profit, non-governmental organization founded by former President Jimmy Carter. The center seeks to wage peace, fight disease, and build hope in a world where people live every day under difficult, life-threatening conditions caused by war, disease, and famine. Prior to her position at the Carter Center, Kent Delaney worked in the Division of Campus Life at Emory University for 15 years and has also held positions at Georgia Tech and Arizona State University. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Kent Delaney. Good afternoon. Hey. Better. Some of you are in my session. I did that each time. Good afternoon. Thank you. I want to say thank you for inviting me to Debbie when she first called. I was not familiar with WordLink, and it has been a great day. I have really enjoyed learning more about the organization and meeting a lot of the students here. So thank you very much. The Carter Center was founded in 1982 by former President Jimmy Carter and former First Lady Rosalind Carter. When President Carter was not reelected, as he always says, forced into early retirement, he was only 56 years old, which made him the youngest ex-president ever. 
And he felt like he had a lot to do, and obviously a long time to do it, because he's 89 and he's still working at it now. Um, the Carter Center, as she said, is a nonprofit, non-governmental organization, and we're based in Atlanta, Georgia. We don't have an office in DC. We are all, all in, in, in Atlanta, although we do have several field offices in other countries. Over the years, the Carter Center programs have improved the quality of life for people in more than 70 countries. The Carter Center is admitted, uh, committed to advancing human rights and alleviating unnecessary human suffering. Our tagline is waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope. So we have peace programs and health programs at the Carter Center. We actually have five peace programs. They are democracy, human rights, conflict resolution, the China's program, and the Americas program. In health programs, we have mental health, and Mrs. Carter has been a mental health advocate for many, many years and has worked tirelessly. In addition, we have international public health programs which focus on neglected tropical diseases. Whether the programs vary from time to time or not, the Carter Center has five principles that we maintain, and they're really important to how we do business. The first one is we, our, emphasize, our emphasis needs to be on results and actions. We're not super research oriented. We do not duplicate other people's efforts, and that's really important because I'll get the question a lot of times, Carter Center has health programs, why don't you have whatever it is, HIV, AIDS, or, or another really important program? And the answer is, because there's a lot of good organizations that are already working on that project, and we don't want to duplicate other people's efforts, we want to make the most of the time and energy that we expend. We understand that sometimes we may fail. We don't like that part of doing business, but that for any growing, thriving organization, that is always a reality, and we accept that as a possible outcome. Number four, we're committed to being neutral. Now that's really, really important to us at the Carter Center. Not only for the democracy program when we go out to monitor an election, we don't say this should be the person who should win or this should not be the person who should win. We're there to say, okay, this was a free and fair election. We believe that people had the opportunity to vote, they had the opportunity to have their voice heard and it was counted and that's what was implemented. And it's no secret that sometimes we don't like the outcome of those things, but that's not what we're there for. We're invited by each of the political parties as a part of the stipulation of us attending and that's something we're gonna hold to, so we are committed to being neutral. And that also crosses over for health programs as well. And number five, and most importantly, we believe that people can improve their own lives if they're given the knowledge, the skill, and the resource to do so. Everybody has the same chance if given those resources. Now, I talked about international public health and um, the fact that we work on neglected tropical diseases. They're referred to as NTDs, neglected tropical diseases. The one that we have worked on and have the program that has had the most impact globally is guinea worm. How many of you have ever, other than the ones who are in my session today, has anybody ever heard of guinea worm before? Okay, you're ahead of me. When I started this job, I had to learn all of it. So congratulations. Guinea worm is a parasite that lives inside the human body. It can grow up to three feet long. So that's roughly from my shoulder to my wrist. And this thing lives inside your body. You get it from drinking water that is contaminated by water fleas, and you ingest the, the water fleas. The male and female will mate in your abdomen and the male dies. The female can take up to a full year before she is full maturity, before she starts to emerge. A full year, you have this parasite living in your body. A full year that you go back to the same watering, the, the same water source over and over again. When she starts to emerge, it forms a blister on your skin, 
and it's painful. They refer to it as the fiery serpent. And you kind of feel like you're getting the flu, a little feverish, a little achy. And she starts to come out, and it is very, very slow. So there's a lot of pictures of people where they're actually taking the guinea worm and they're wrapping it around a small wooden stick because they don't want her to pull back into the, into the body. She's going to take several weeks to do that. And if you pull it out, she can break because the end of her has a hook on it. So she's, she's pretty, pretty much set in there, and you have to be patient and let it come out slowly. Well, it's painful, and it takes a long time. So what people do to relieve the pain is they get back into the water. Because what could feel better on a hot day when you're uncomfortable than the nice, cool water? And that's exactly where she wants to be. She will come out all the way, lay her eggs, and that is the life cycle of the guinea worm. That's it. It's very simple. There's not a huge mystery to it anymore. But without knowing how it is perpetuated, the perception was that guinea worm came from spoiled meat or that it was some type of witchcraft or something else. It was none of those things. Small water fleas. So the way that we protect people from guinea worm is by teaching them to filter their water. And that has been very, very effective. In 1986, when the Carter Center first started working on guinea worm, there were 3.5 million cases of guinea worm in the world. In, 20, in 20 country, 21 countries in Asia and in Africa. Last year, there were 143 cases in the world. Period. Thank you. <laughs> Of those 143 cases, 113 of them were in South Sudan. Why? Because of the conflict. It has been such a challenge. Health, global health and conflict go hand in hand. If people don't feel safe, they're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to send staff in there. Some of the villages are very remote and it has been a challenge but it shows that simple solutions for a low-cost option can, in fact, will succeed. And guinea worm is slated to be the second disease ever eradicated from the earth, right behind smallpox. Now, my role at the Carter Center is Director of Educational Programs, and most of the time I have the opportunity of dealing with the interns. We have approximately 125 interns each year, and they're college students, juniors and seniors. They are smart, they're curious, and on a really good day, they are sure they can change the world. Now, I know that right now college seems fairly off, especially being an upperclassman, a junior, a senior, but it's not. It's going to go quickly. And I encourage you to think ahead, not just now, and you're already doing that. By being at a conference like this, you are showing that you are interested in being a global citizen. And I encourage you to continue on that path. Maybe you'll choose to apply to be a Carter Center intern. Maybe you won't. But you must always believe that you can, in fact, change the world for a small cost with a lot of effort. So I encourage you to continue to take classes, to take opportunities to engage with others, this morning, Cedric said that we can make a difference, and I believe that that is true, and I believe that e each of you are capable of doing that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ms. Cantalini. And finally, we have Wesley Farrow. Wesley Farrow serves as West Coast Manager for the Speak Truth to Power program at the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, a multifaceted global initiative that uses the experience of courageous peacemakers to educate others on issues ranging from environmental activism to political participation. After graduating from the University of Michigan with degrees in economics and psychology, Farrow worked overseas in the nonprofit sector and moved to Los Angeles to work for Teach for America. He continues to work in the public school system and serves as board member for the Ed Agency, Students of the World, and Coro Southern California. 
Please join me in welcoming Wesley Farrell. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, as was mentioned, I used to be a teacher in Los Angeles. Uh, and this energy that I felt today through all of these young people and the adults who support and facilitate this space and this event has been nothing less than inspiring. Um, each and every person that I had a chance to talk to today, whether they were from a school in North San Diego County or Tijuana, had something to say about why they were here and where they're going next. Uh, and that's very inspiring to me individually and also very well connected with the work uh, of the RFK Center as a whole. Um, so I want to talk today and focus specifically on, on three concepts. And those three concepts are hope, human rights, and the power of the individual. Uh, the Robert F. Kennedy Center was founded in 1968 by friends and family of Robert F. Kennedy after he was uh, very tragically killed in Los Angeles. Um, at that point in his life, he had served as Attorney General under his brother John F. Kennedy's presidential uh, office and was a central agent in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, as well as serving his country in a variety of other public service uh, roles. Uh, in 1968, he was campaigning in the Democratic primary for, uh, for the office of President of the United States. And he was a man of great vision and great hopes. Uh, he often is quoted as saying, many people ask, why? And I ask, why not? He was a man of possibility and of vision. Um, and the legacy that we at the RFK Center are tasked with um, is through the scope of human rights uh, and taking the hope that Robert F. Kennedy brought to many people in his life and bringing it through the lens of human rights. So to focus for a moment on what human rights means and how we work, uh, human rights is a very broad issue. We talked in our session today a bit about what it means. And once again, I was very impressed that uh, the high school students consistently had answers better than most adults that I've ever talked to. Um, but human rights, as much as it can be discussed and, and has in certain points in time, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, been written down and codified, it's a very subjective experience. The idea of a human right is something that everyone is entitled to, and everyone is a different person. And so it comes down to that individual and the power of that individual. So at the RFK Center, we have a series of programs that address human rights, um, and I'm gonna explain them in a sort of triangular format. So at the very top of that triangle, we have a program called Partners for Human Rights. And Partners for Human Rights works directly with human rights defenders around the world. They include uh, folks like Stephen Bradbury, who organizes in Louisiana. And uh, just this last year, we were able to help settle a $200 million lawsuit with BP that will build health clinics across four states uh, along the Gulf of Mexico to help provide services to folks who were impacted by the oil spill and before that, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so from the work of Stephen Bradbury in Louisiana to the work of Frank Mugisha in Uganda, where we just a few days ago, um, were a part of, uh, of uh, the group of folks connecting uh, Desmond Tutu with President Museveni to stop a bill going through the legislature that would make homosexuality illegal. Amidst that environment, uh, Frank Mugisha works actively organizing in the LGBT community as an openly gay man in a country where legislation is considered that makes his identity punishable by death. Uh, from Uganda to India, where we've worked with Kailash Satyarthi, who goes into communities that have lived under generational bonded labor, where parents pass along to children a life of slavery, not knowing their opportunity to leave or even an opportunity to earn compensation for their work. 
And in those communities, Kailash comes in and educates and uses education as a mechanism for mobility and to empower people to find their own power as individuals and through hope to move and transcend out of slavery. Our work spans these contexts, these defenders, and many more at that top level through Partners of Human Rights. Uh, in the middle of the triangle, we work with particular communities of leadership uh, here in the US and abroad. Uh, that includes the uh, journalism community. We have an annual RFK Journalism Award. Um, it also includes the institutional investor community, which is a program I find fascinating, but most people don't. Um, we look at the way that pension funds and sovereign wealth funds utilize their broad investment structures to invest in ways that are impacted by and have an impact on human rights. So if you're curious to know more of the details of risk mitigation and long-term portfolio stability, you can talk to me afterward, but I'm guessing that's not everyone's interest area. Um, which brings us to the bottom of the triangle and what I find to be the most important part of all the work we do, uh, and that is Speak Truth to Power. Speak Truth to Power pulls from the very top, from the stories of individuals who are creating change and making the world a more just and peaceful place. It pulls from their stories and creates lessons that go into classrooms and help teach students not only about the concepts of human rights and what human rights can mean, but about what's happening and who out there right now, today, in our world, who out there is working to change the world and make it a more just and safe place. Um, through each lesson, they culminate in a section called Become a Defender, in which students are encouraged through project-based learning and inquiry-based research to find ways that they themselves can use their own power, their own resources, their own connections, their own ideas to create change in their community, whether that's on behalf of themselves, their neighbors, their family, or communities on the other side of the world. By creating this platform for all the work we do, we seek to truly change the way that folks of your generation and those that come after you understand concepts of hope, human rights, and individual empowerment. Because when human rights can be used as a lens, the mechanisms of change can be applied to everyone, not only those who are privileged in various ways, be it social or economic. And when hope can be attached to concepts of human rights, it can bring power to people in understanding how they themselves can be a part of that change. I want to reiterate something that uh, also was discussed during our session today, which is that change doesn't mean everything. Change starts with you, and change starts with each one of you. Uh, the decisions that you make to come here today were decisions of courage, decisions of, I would say, wisdom, intelligence, compassion, vision. It's a choice you made as an individual to be here amongst people who are sharing a similar interest in conflict resolution and global human rights. Those decisions you make each day within yourself, between yourself and your peers, are a part of the broader context in which our world becomes a more just and safe and meaningful place to live. So I'd, I'd like to share with you um, a quote from, uh, from Robert F. Kennedy that I find to be one of his most broad and inspiring uh, quotes. Um, but before I do that, I want to I wanna ask for those of you who are open to it to close your eyes for just a moment because I want it to be kind of quiet and, and peaceful in the room. And if you're willing to close your eyes and visualize, I want you to picture this entire room as a body of water. So a peaceful body of water, either a pond or a lake or maybe a, a slow moving stream. Each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lots of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing one another from a million different directions of energy and daring, these ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of resistance. Those of you who learned something today, I'd like you to raise your hand. Those of you who learned something today that you can act upon, 
if you could raise your hand a little bit higher. And those of you who haven't opened your eyes yet, please do so now. And look around at all these ripples in this room. And think just for a moment about what's going to happen when we all leave today. And we go back to our respective schools, our respective communities, our respective countries with these ripples inside of us, but these ripples also on the other side of the world. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Mr. Farrow. Everyone, please join me in thanking our closing speakers and all of our conference speakers for spending the day with us and believing. Next, I would like to welcome my fellow WorldLink interns to the stage. For your closing address, please welcome Lily Greenberg Call from the San Diego Jewish Academy and Eileen Sayo from Scripps Ranch High School. Good afternoon, everyone. We hope that you enjoyed your time here at WorldLink's 17th Annual Youth Town Meeting. My name is Eileen Sayo, and I'm a junior attending Scripps Ranch High School. As Chi Chi mentioned, I was a 2013 Summer WorldLink intern. I was as well. My name is Lily Greenberg Call, and I am a junior attending the San Diego Jewish Academy. It has been such a pleasure to have distinguished guest speakers join us from near and far. Meeting individuals from the Carter Center, UNICEF, and the Program for Torture Victims has been eye-opening and inspiring, to say the least. It has been a big day, and this event could not have been made possible without the participation and support of so many people. First and foremost, we would like to thank our 2013-2014 WorldLink donors. Please join us in thanking each of them with a round of applause. Thank you to the Kimberly Heller Charitable Gift Fund. Thank you to the Serenity Grace Foundation. The Verizon Foundation. Steven Strachan. And thank you to David and Elizabeth Johnson. We would also like to thank our wonderful volunteers, several who have been with us since 6 a.m. Also, a special thank you to all of the dedicated teachers and adult chaperones that helped ensure all of your participation. Next, this event also could not have been possible without our 2014 student moderators, journalists, photographers, and videographers. As a reminder, at the beginning of the closing plenary, you received an evaluation form, which asks you to give feedback about what you thought about today's Youth Town meeting. So fill those out, and volunteers will collect them upon leaving. We would also like to thank all of you, WorldLink's 2014 conference delegates. Give yourself a round of applause. And last, but certainly not least, we would like to thank the WorldLink program at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice, here at the University of San Diego's Kroc School of Peace Studies, without which this day could not have been made possible. Each and every one of us has learned something valuable about both the political and social urgencies stemming from global conflict. Global conflicts are ravaging nations, exacerbating human lives, and tearing apart families even as we speak. 
We hear about conflicts occurring in countries like Syria and the Democratic Republic of Congo, but we skim the headlines like they have no connection to us as we're on the other side of the planet. But, global, but human lives are all interconnected. An incursion on one human life is an encroachment that threatens all of humanity. Our lives are all interconnected, much like a large web. Let us aid in the effort to make positive changes in our world to find solutions to conflict. Since the beginning of civilization, from dates reaching all the way back to ancient empires, conflict and war have plagued humanity. Violence has taken precedence in remedying misunderstandings and with, that, with diplomacy. But today, we know that the human lives being lost and destroyed in these conflicts are each very personal and cannot be measured in any material resource. To challenge conflict or war is to challenge a deeply rooted aspect of human culture that has existed inside us for thousands of years. As Thomas Paine once said, time makes more converts than reason. Time, tradition gives us the false impression that we can't change what happened in the past, that we can't alter a seated custom. It's true that we can't alter the past, but what's even more important than altering the past is shaping our future. We learn from our past mistakes so we can carefully plan for the future as to not make the same lapses. Finding peaceful ways to compromise before hostilities give away to violence is something that we can do to mold a brighter future. We learn to question and to innovate new ways to solve old problems. And no, more likely than not, we won't see these changes overnight, but through gradual gains in peacemaking, we can move our world forward without lives being devastated, families being lost. We, the youth of today, have the power to change tomorrow. I'm proud of you. Every single one of you. And you might be wondering why. I'm proud of you because you've taken a chance by attending today's conference. You missed a day of school, maybe you missed a test, maybe you annoyed a teacher because of that. But you broke the chain. You unzipped the daily routine of your life and you stepped out of it. To be honest, us teenagers, we're pretty self-centered. Our society encourages us to be. We spend so much time focusing on bettering ourselves and making ourselves great to get into college and worrying about fulfilling obligations to ourselves, which is fine. But today, you've experienced a different perspective a way of viewing the world through the lens of how can I elevate other people. Experiences like WorldLink's Youth Town Meeting help bring us beyond our own worlds. And when we focus on other people and on global problems, it fosters our sense of community. We become better empathizers, better listeners, and in turn, better humans. So now you have been given these new tools. Carry them with you as you go about your daily life. This day can influence the rest of your life. You've been given the most valuable gift, the gift of knowledge. You're much more aware of the problems we face as well as with the world's potential solutions. However, what matters now is what you are going to do with this newfound knowledge. So you may be asking yourself, what's next? Are you interested in staying connected to one another? Would you like to take these conversations and convert them into action plans? This Sunday, WorldLink will be hosting a WorldLink workshop, which is going to be titled Annual Youth Town Meeting, Next Steps. All interested students who attended this conference are invited to a smaller workshop, providing you the opportunity to reflect on your experiences today and to initiate action plans. You each received a flyer in your tote bag with information about this event. And make sure to RSVP right away because spaces are limited. Today, you have already taken an important step to change the world for a better tomorrow. Learn to challenge your preconceptions, to question traditional values, and to make a positive impact on the world. Your participation in WorldLink's 17th Annual Youth Town Meeting is a tremendous start, and there are only greater experiences to come. The youth has the power to produce changes in our society, but never forget that it all begins with you. Thank you, and have a wonderful rest of the day.